welcome, welcome one and all, step right up and get your tickets for another moment in gaming history. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel, or if you're new here, welcome officially to the channel. This is a series where we're going to various different moments in video game history, and today I want to talk about the inception of a type of developer that we all take for granted as a thing, the third party developer. It may seem odd to think about, but this wasn't always a thing, especially in the very early days of the industry. So if you have a moment, sit back and hang out a while as we go into the history of the third party developer. Before we get too deep into the third party developer, perhaps we should talk about the history of game development in the early days and the types of different developers. You see, developers are commonly divided into basically three camps, first party, second party, and third party. The first party developer is the most obvious. These developers tend to work directly for the console manufacturer. They often have the most knowledge of the hardware early on in the console's lifespan and are entrusted with the most important IPs to the console's success. Examples being pretty obvious with Halo, God of War, and the Mario series. One of the larger financial advantages to this is the lack of need to make royalty payments on the game's profits. In short, the company gets to keep pretty much all the profits. Now the second party developer gets a little bit more vague. This type of developer is often contracted to develop games specific to a given platform. As compensation for making these games exclusive, they're commonly given higher royalties on the game in question. The last one is the one we're most interested in and that's the third party developer. This is the one that we're going to talk about in particular because part of how it came about. I know many of you are scoffing and saying, oh come on, these have always been there. Well, no, not really. You see, in the early days of the industry, all the technology was proprietary systems like the Odyssey, where you basically just rewired the hardware. Consoles like the Fairchild Channel F used carts, but that technology was so new, very few were investing in it just yet. That wouldn't really happen until Atari hit the scene around 1977 with the Atari VCS, which most of you know better as the Atari 2600. Atari had all the right contacts in the arcades to basically bring these games to the home console, if they didn't already own those IPs outright to begin with. As they brought more and more of these to the home console, the console grew in popularity. More and more developers wanted to work there but it quickly became a division between Atari and developers. Many of them became disillusioned with how they were currently being treated. You see, Atari built its company off arcade games, initially, but it was exclusives and unique games built like Adventure, Bowling, and Starship that really started to catapult the console upwards. However, none of these developers got any credit for their work. That's right, in this day and age, developers could not put their name on their work which eventually led to the first easter egg in adventure as an act of rebellion by a developer named Warren Robinette. It wasn't long after this kind of act of rebellion and this kind of division in the ranks that Atari sold its business to Time Warner. When that happened, a few of the developers got the idea of how much their games had made for the company. David Crane, Larry Kaplan, Bob Whitehead, and Alan Miller alone had made the company $60 million in a single year. They decided to go to the new CEO and ask for credit in the games that they had worked in. The CEO flat out said no, and told them that they were no more important than the people who packed the games in the boxes to ship them. That's when Crane and Miller decided to leave the company, and shortly after, Whitehead and Kaplan as well. The four of them formed a new company called Activision. The name itself was half out of spite, since it came before Atari in the alphabet, so their games would obviously show up first when listed alphabetically. With their extensive knowledge of Atari console, they were able to quickly distinguish themselves as one of the premier developers for the system, which made Atari quite unhappy. They decided to basically sue Activision for copyright infringement as well as claiming the studio had access to trade secrets. However, unfortunately for them, Activision had already set aside money expecting just this tactic and also made sure that they built their own developer tools to work on the games. The lawsuit took three years, from 1979 all the way to 1982, and in the end, Activision stood. They agreed to pay royalties to Atari for the games that they sold on their system, officially established themselves as the very first third-party developer. 
What do you guys think about these crazy turn of events? Did any of you even already know about this? What are some of your favorite games by Activision on the system? Let me know in the comments. While you're there, please leave this video a like, and if you haven't, subscribe. That helps me out a ton. For now though, thank you so much for making it this far in the video, I really do appreciate it. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and until we meet again, happy gaming.